Forgive me for sitting. Uh, I've always sat when I've given lectures. And I don't know whether it's because if I didn't, I'd be running up and down or simply to deal with my nerves. But I've always done it, so forgive me for doing it now. So, my job is to tell you about Larry's greatest discovery and to tell you in terms that can be understood whether you're a scientist or not. So, suppose that you go and have your eyes tested. One of the tests that they'll give you is to show you dim spots of light and every time you see a dim spot of light, you press a button. And first they'll test one eye and then the other, probably by putting something over one eye so that they can test the other one. So why are they doing that? Well, they're doing that to see if there's some area of your vision in which you're blind. And one way in which that could happen is if your retina, which contains the light-sensitive elements, has become detached. And in fact, Larry um, had uh, the signs of that happening and had surgery, and it was put right. And not long afterwards, I had exactly the same thing. And again, uh, it was put right. But there's another way that you could be blind. And that would be if the area which receives information from the eye, which is called the striate cortex, or the primary visual cortex, V1, was itself damaged. And this diagram shows you that the eye sends connections which connect via what's called the lateral geniculate nucleus, and they then go to the striate cortex. Now, if your striate cortex in one hemisphere was damaged, you would be blind in both eyes for half of what you see. That is, you'd fail to see anything to one side if you fixate centrally. Now, I was a postdoc with Larry from 1970 to 75. And it was during this time that Larry made the discovery that I'm going to talk about. He was working in the National Hospital for Mental and Nervous Diseases, as it was then called, in London, and he found a patient who's referred to by the initials DB. And this patient had damage in one hemisphere to strike cortex. And what you've got on the slide is an arrow pointing to where strike cortex is, and that's the area that was damaged in patient DB. Now, instead of asking DB simply to press a button every time he saw a spot of light, Larry did something different. What he asked DB to do was simply to point to where the light was. Now, of course, with the intact hemisphere, he can see fine, and as you can see, um, this shows you the position of his finger and the position of the target, and if they're in exact registration, then the spots will line up, as they do here, at 45 degrees. No problem, this is the part of his vision where he can see, and he can point to something within it. But what was really surprising was that he was nearly as good if you showed the targets 
to his blind field. Now, actually, Larry was not the first person to show this. The year before, the neurologist Purple with Held and Frost had published a paper in Nature, and in this they had said that they had patients with damage to strike cortex who, if they were asked to look at where the target was, were able to do so, even though the target was projected onto the blind part of their vision. Well, there are two things to be said about that. The first is that the data in, those paper, in that paper were really not that convincing. In other words, the registration of where the person was looking and where the target was was nothing like as precise as it was in the pointing experiment that Larry did. But there's a more important point to make. And this is that Larry was a great scientist. So he did two things. The first is that he pursued the finding. He didn't just publish it and leave it. He pursued it, and I'll tell you how. But secondly, he worked out what the implications of the finding were. So, first, how did he pursue it? Well, he had a really inspired move. He thought, what we'll get them to do is not to point, but simply to make guesses about the target. So, for a second patient, known by the initials GY, GY was asked to guess whether a dot was moving up or moving horizontally. And GY was incredibly accurate, over 90% correct. So over 9 out of 10 times, he got it right. Even though the target was being shown to his blind field. But Larry had then another move which was equally inspired. And that was this, that for every guess that, in this case, GY made, Larry asked the patient to press a button to say either whether he had seen the target, was aware of it, or had seen nothing. And Larry called that the commentary key. And the result is shown here that if the target was moving slowly, GY was very accurate in guessing the direction, and yet always said that he saw nothing. And that let Larry who liked puns to invent the term blindsight, meaning seeing without awareness. Now, I said he pursued it, but he also worked out its implications. And he did that in a later book. And in this book, he argued that there must be what he called a commentary stage. So in the processing in the brain, he's suggesting there must be a stage in that processing at which awareness occurs. There's somewhere in the brain that's critical for that awareness. And he called it the commentary stage because, of course, your evidence for that awareness was the pressing of the, coven the commentary key. Now, in the book, he wasn't sure where in the brain that commentary stage was. He made several suggestions, 
but it wasn't clear which at the time was correct. So the obvious thing to do was do an experiment. And the experiment that he did was to use brain imaging. Now this is, as you'll see, in the very early days in which functional magnetic brain imaging had come into being. And they made use of the following. If the spot was moving slowly, GY said he was never aware. But if it moved fast enough, GY was aware of something. So now you've got two conditions, one in which he's aware, and the other of which is he's not aware. And if you compare the not aware with the aware condition, they found the following results, that there was activity in the prefrontal cortex. Now, anybody who's seen brain images these days will see that these are very crude images indeed. But this was done uh, only a year or two after uh, functional magnetic brain imaging had become possible. But of course, there's a problem with the experiment. And that is that the stimuli are not the same. The stimulus, when he's not aware, is a slow-moving stimulus, whereas the stimulus, when he is aware, is a fast-moving stimulus. So how do we know that that activity isn't something simply to do with the speed of movement of the stimulus? Well, the obvious thing to do is to follow up the experiment. And we did that, and we again used brain imaging. But there was one difference in the way that we did it. On some trials, we presented the stimulus to the damaged hemisphere, and I'll show you how we did that. And on other trials, we presented it to the intact hemisphere. But whichever trial it was, the stimuli were always the same. So we got over that problem. These are the stimuli, and in a minute I'll tell you what the task was. Now, how can you present first to one hemisphere, then the other? Well, it so happens that the visual pathways are set up in such a way that if, as here, you show the stimulus to the far right and the person's looking ahead, the information will go to the left hemisphere, whereas if you show it to the far left, it will go to the right hemisphere. And the task was simply to say, were the vertical lines above or below the horizontal lines? Well, we scanned. And this is what we found in the blind hemisphere. And everything you see in red is evidence that in those, those areas there was activity. So how come there could be activity in the blind hemisphere with no striate cortex or with a, a large striate lesion? How come there could be activity to visual stimuli? Well. In the earlier experiment, Larry had suggested that there was an indirect route via which vision could reach the cortex, and that would be via the superior colliculus. And Alan Cowie and Petra Sturry and Paul Azapardi uh, did work showing that there were other possible routes via which, in the absence of striate cortex, vision can still reach these areas. For example, it can actually go via the lateral geniculate. But what did we find 
in the intact hemisphere. Well, that picture on the right is a picture showing you what is more in the intact hemisphere than the blind hemisphere. And as you can see, one of the areas that is more active in the intact aware hemisphere is the prefrontal cortex, just as Larry had said. But of course, you'll also notice that there are other areas that are also more active. And these are referred to as either the dorsal or the ventral visual areas, and Mel Goodale will be saying more about those. So this experiment doesn't tell us, of those areas, which one is critical for the commentary stage. So, Hakuan Lao uh, and I did another imaging experiment, but in this case, it wasn't on patients. It was on healthy subjects. And they're presented very, very briefly with either a diamond or a square. So you either get one or other of those. And that's followed very soon afterwards by another stimulus here called the masking stimulus. Now that is in exactly the same place as the diamond or the square was. And this is technically called metacontrast masking. And we varied the interval between showing the diamond or square and the mask. It could either be 33 or 104 milliseconds. And that matters because we know from recording from the brain, and this is from other people's data, that if the interval is very short, as shown on the right, the signal is smaller than if the interval is long. The internal signal is cut off. And the result is that if the interval is long, 104 milliseconds, shown by the histogram which is in white, a greater percentage of the trials were trials in which the people said they saw the stimulus, they saw the diamond or they saw the square. So now we can compare, using brain imaging, trials on which we have the long delay 104 milliseconds, when they're more likely to see it, with the trials with the shorter one, when they're less likely to see it. And that's the result. We get activity in prefrontal cortex and prefrontal cortex alone. And that, of course, is exactly what Larry had originally claimed. But, as with all experiments, you could complain there are things still to be tied up. After all, um, when they're aware, they're more likely to be pressing one key than the other one. So there's a difference in the probability of pressing the two keys. So how do we know that that isn't simply related to how likely they are to press one key or the other. Well, to find out, we can do studies on animals, and in this case, the study was done on monkeys, and they recorded in much the same area of prefrontal cortex, and they recorded using what are called microelectrodes, which are very, very thin electrodes. And they don't actually penetrate the cells, they end up near the cell, and they record from cells one at once. And the task, uh, oh, I, I had forgotten to tell you, in case you're worried about it, 
Um, it's not actually painful, and the reason is that there are no pain fibers in the brain tissue itself. So even in patients during surgery who are awake, um, recordings are taken under some circumstances. So, so the monkey experiment. On 50% of the trials, there's a target shown at the top, and on 50% of the trials, there's no target, randomized. Only later is a cue shown, which is either red or blue, and the cue tells the animal what to do, how to report whether it's seen or not. And it can report either by releasing the lever or by holding it. And as you can see, uh, whether the target appears or not appears, they still have to decide which of the two movements they're going to make. And the recordings are taken when the monkey doesn't actually yet know which response to make. And what you find is cells shown in red that fire before the animal knows what response to make. And these are cells that fire when the animal is reporting that it's seen. And there are other cells that fire when the animal is reporting that it hasn't seen. And it simply doesn't matter what response is made. The response, as you can see here, is either release a solid line or hold a dotted line, and you get the same result. And the same for not seen. So, what we found here genuinely re reflects awareness of seeing. It's nothing to do with pressing keys. So now, if we go back to our original data, it looks as if the area that I marked here, the ventral prefrontal cortex, which is active in the intact hemisphere, but shows no activity in the blind hemisphere, may indeed be critical for the promontory stage. And importantly, it receives information about shape, and of course you're shown shapes, from an area in the temporal lobe, and that area is referred to as LOC, the lateral occipital complex. But now we've got one last thing to tie up, because why isn't enough? for awareness, simply to have activity in the lateral occipital complex. Well, again, the thing to do is to record. And here the recordings were taken both in prefrontal cortex and in an area, V4, it's one of the visual areas, which is part of together with an area called TEO, what we call the lateral occipital complex in people. And what we're going to do is look at what happens when the animal reports they have seen the target, and it was there, and when they report they haven't seen the target, but it was there. So, those are missing. Now, if you look in area V4, the activity is almost as great for misses as it is for hits. If it was exactly the same, that would be 100. But now look at prefrontal cortex there's almost no activity for misses 
at all. So in other words, whereas area B4 has a signal which seems to be tied to the input, if you look in prefrontal cortex, what you're looking at is something which seems to reflect our awareness. So, Larry was right that prefrontal activity seems to reflect our awareness. And, of course, Larry realized what that meant. It has something to do with the problem of consciousness. And, of course, this book was called Consciousness Lost and Found. Now, when I was an undergraduate, it was in the old building, and consciousness was never mentioned. If you'd mentioned it in finals, you would have been failed. So what Larry has done is made the scientific study of consciousness respectable because he saw that blind sight was a way into the problem. And the consequences have been huge. A journal was set up, the Journal of Consciousness Studies. An association was set up, the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness. And, of course, Larry, at one time, was the president. But there's a moral of the story. When I was a postdoc, the grant was from the Medical Research Council and it was to study vision. And here I've labelled the stride cortex. But I came from London, having done my PhD in 1970, and I said that I wanted to work on the prefrontal cortex. And the reason was that that's what I had worked on in London. My supervisor had let me do what I wanted, and I said I wanted to work on the prefrontal cortex. And I came back to Oxford, and Larry, um, I was with Larry, and the grant was on vision, but I still said I wanted to work on prefrontal cortex. But at the time, I wasn't working on awareness. I was working on action. And it was at least 25 years before the prefrontal cortex was thought to have anything to do with awareness. Yet, Larry let me do what I wanted, even though the work seemed irrelevant for the grant, and he never put his name on a single one of the papers. Try that on the MRC today. Thank you.